Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Dunkin' Donuts and today we're going to be going through 10 things that I wish I knew when I very first started playing Noraka back on its initial release. And number one is going to be Tay Management. So I'm not 100% sure that this is necessarily going to apply once the new update hits tomorrow with the free to play and PlayStation, all of that, since I've heard some things about a new currency called Hero Coins and something I'm, I'm not really sure how it's going to work exactly but it may make some of what i'm about to tell you uh, like obsolete but i'm going to tell you anyway just in case it doesn't so when you first start naraka you're going to be bombarded with all the amazing stuff that you can spend your tay on but there is an actual optimal way of spending it at the very very beginning you're going to have this tay this this in-game currency and you can spend it on whenever you like, really. Like, realistically, you can play the, spend it on whatever you like. You can spend it on cosmetic, you can what spend it on whatever. Or new characters. But, when you're very first starting out, the best way to spend your Tay is to save it on glyphs. So that you can upgrade your glyphs when you unlock those slots. Because glyphs are possibly one of the most important parts of Naraka, especially at the very beginning. Because if you don't have your glyphs all leveled up then you're going to be at the disadvantage when it comes to being in game since glyphs essentially give you in game bonuses such as stamina rage regeneration luck cooldown reduction all of that stuff so don't spend your tay on whatever like the the very first thing you see because you're going to need it upgrading all of these glyphs from 0 to level 1 to level 5 is going to cost quite a bit of tay. So that's going to lead me right on to uh, number 2, the second thing that I wish I knew, which was how important these glyphs really are. Glyphs give you passive bonuses stats when in-game, things such as stamina regen, as I just said, and at the very beginning you're only going to have 4 glyph slots available. So let's say for example... Let's see now. Let me do this real quick. So, very yeah. yeah. So, at the very, very beginning, you're only going to have four glyph slots. You're going to have one here, one here, one here, and one here. And you're going to unlock a new one every two levels. And you'll only unlock all of them at level 46. Now, usually, the best, pl the best bet early on as a new player is to simply go for full stamina, taking full red purple and green stamina glyphs which is these ones these ones and these ones so for taking full stamina glyphs you're going to want to be taking full red energy per second full purple dodge energy cost reduction and full maximum energy greens and this is very important for solos as it allows you to move around a lot more and allows you to stay on the move and when you're fighting opponents it's Stamina becomes very important because it allows you to avoid taking gambits and taking, making decisions that you don't want to make. Being able to choose, or be able to choose to dodge away and to avoid something as opposed to standing there and fighting and standing there and either parrying or attacking or whatever it may be is very, very useful and very important when it comes to solos. However, when it comes to team modes, this is where things change. In game modes such as duos and trios, there isn't as much of an importance of ha for having stamina as having more uptime on your ultimate ability is going to be more important for you. This is due to the fact that trios is largely based around coordination and synergy between you and your teammates and their ultimate abilities, since they hugely impact fights. Uh, well, they're hugely impactful on fights. Um, a, couple, uh, a couple really strong trios compositions that you could try out if you're interested are Tianhai, Kurumi, and Yueishan. This is your traditional Transformers team comp. Or if you're feeling more aggressive, you can always play something like Tumulk, Takeda, and Zipping. You can always choose for a more of a heavy rage build, but if that's if that's what you want but what that's one of the great things about glyphs is that you can customize the glyphs to fit you and your playstyle and how you 
you plan to play the game. So if you're playing something such as Transformers, which is your Yueshan, Kurumi, and Tianhai, you're going to want to have quite a bit of rage because your ultimates are extremely important. However, when you're playing something else, it might not be as important to you. you know, for example, let's say you're playing Taka in Trias. Taka, my favorite character by far. Um, you don't really want to take rage on him in Trias, as quite frankly, if you get caught when you're playing this character, you're very likely going to die. <laughs> and you need the stamina to be able to maneuver around the fights so that you can stay alive and be impactful on the fights. So it's very much up to you and what characters you're playing and what the team composition requires from you, if that makes sense. But yeah, so when it comes to blue, as I said, preference, this is up to you, really. Skill cooldown, grapple distance, you know, luck. Like, these different glyphs are... Like, they're, they're much more personal. Like, you can take a little bit more grapple distance if you feel like it. You can take more skill cooldown if you if you so choose. I personally take school cool, skill cooldown because I feel like it's one of those glyphs that's just going to give me a flat bonus all the time. Whereas with something like luck, luck falls off the later on into a game that you go. Because once you get to mid to late game, you're not going to be looting around. You're going to have the loot that you want for end game. And you're not necessarily going to make use of this stat. So, it's up to you, really. But, uh, as I said, when you first start, you're only going to have four of these slots. And you won't get all of them unlocked until you hit level 46. It's a pain. And that leads me on to the third thing that I wish I knew. Which was how to level up quickly. Leveling up is probably going to be the focus for a lot of you. So... If you're like me and you can't be bothered up, bothered, bothered, bothered up, Lamar. <laughs> if you can't be bothered leveling up slowly by just simply playing, and you're looking to speed run level so you can get to ranked as soon as possible. So here are a few tips. Firstly, if you head on over to this tab, season eight, which will likely say season something for whenever you're play you're 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 watching this video, for tomorrow or probably say season nine. If you go to here, this is where your battle pass is going to be. Um, all that good stuff, right? But here, if you click quests, this is going to take you to the quest tab, right? I mean, it's all pretty self-explanatory. At the very beginning, you're going to always have daily quests, right? Nothing too crazy about that. You're going to have all your weekly quests. These week quests are going to uh, unlock every week makes sense right pretty easy but you can go through all of these quests every single week and you can even go through all of these season quests now season quests they're going to give you a lot more experience but obviously because they're supposed to be quests that you would complete throughout the season they're going to take slightly longer to do um but the main thing here that a lot of people didn't realize very oh i don't realize at the very beginning is that unless this these quests whenever it lists a quest, for example, I'm trying to find one here. Here. So unless it explicitly tells you that you cannot do this quest in bot mode, then it means that you're going to be able to do it in bot mode. So essentially, you can head on head on over to to bot mode over here, queue up, and just spam these quests. You know, like it's it's just that simple. So one more thing I'd probably recommend, you could simply just take a little notepad out on your, like a piece of paper, whatever it may be, or just a notepad on your PC, pull it up, write down some quests, you know, so that you can go into a game, go into a bot mode and just grind it out. There is a feature that allows you to track quests. However, as you can see, it only allows you to have five tracked quests at any one time. And if you're looking to speed run these levels, then you're probably going to want to have to, you're probably going to want to, be able to do more than five quests in one game uh, or know which quest you have to do all the time so i'd probably just get a notepad out make things very very easy um but yeah another way another really good way of leveling up are xp boosts sadly you can't buy these from the normal shop so here if you go to go to the normal shop you can't buy them from here sadly however if you go down here to the event center 
you have to limited time events, you can typically buy XP boosts. So, for example, here, two hour XP boost. You can buy this for whatever this event's currency is, and it will allow you to level up much faster. It's in the name. Not very, yeah, not very uh, complicated. But yeah, that's one good thing as well, though, that Naraka does very, very well, and very often, is that there is always an event going on. They've done this for as long as I can remember. I don't think there's ever been a week where there hasn't been an event going on. So don't worry, there will probably be an event that you can get an XP boost if you so want to do that. And that takes us to number four, optimal settings. The graphics in Araka are truly beautiful. If you crank it all the way up, you're going to feel like you're walking around in a movie. However, sadly, this is uh, not really what you're going to want, unless you're planning on playing this game in the most casual of senses, you know. So what you're going to want to do is go into your graphic settings and literally turn every single setting down to the minimum possible setting. So as you can see here, every single thing to the lowest, every single thing. Since you're going to want to have the highest FPS possible, since it's very impactful. There's a lot of stuff going on in game. FPS does have a fact, like it does play a role in the game. So definitely very, very important. Um, when it comes to DLSS though, there are some people who swear by it and think that DLSS is definitely something to have on, but then there are a whole bunch of people who think the opposite. And I'm one of those people. Personally, one, I don't really like how it makes the game look. I don't really like how it looks. And two, when I've used it to test it out, I've not really seen that big of an improvement, but it's probably something to do with my PC, and it'll probably be different for everybody. So I would recommend that you go and do some testing, try out the different settings, try out different, uh, try out DLSS, see if it works for you. If it does, great. If not, don't use it. Um, and if you are planning on not having everything on lowest or anything like that, I still very strongly recommend that you make sure that modeling accuracy, this setting right here, is turned all the way to lowest. If you have it on low, like you still need to have it on lowest, basically. When you have it on low, what this does, essentially, is puts more shrubbery and grass and leaves into the world. So, But when you have it on the lowest possible setting, it removes all of that. So not only is it going to allow you to see things better, like literally it makes things far more visible from much further away, your vision is going to be obscured by leaves, grass, random bushes, you know, you don't want that. And on top of that, it's going to boost performance a considerable amount. Having it on lowest does make a big difference because it means that your PC doesn't have to render all of this unnecessary stuff. However, it does look really pretty when you have it on. So, you know, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, it's, I personally would never put it on, but anyway, moving on from graphic settings, I'd also like to recommend a few other settings you should definitely make sure you have on. And if you head on over to gameplay, one of the most important ones is ceiling interaction. So this allows you to attach yourself to ceilings by simply jumping to them and holding W. As opposed to having to grapple to them. Here, if you see off, you can only hang from ceilings by grappling hooks. So you'd have to grapple to the ceiling and then not press anything and it would attach you to the ceiling. But if you have this on, W and spacebar will attach you to the ceiling and it will then allow you to use ceilings um, to essentially scale rush off from we're going to talk more about that a little bit um but one step at a time another thing definitely important to have on i would say is grappling hook shot this by default is set to auto aim auto aim however i would suggest that you change it to auto aim manual aim or manual aim auto aim depending on which button you want to have to click this allows you to grapple Invisible targets allows you to grapple the floor or whatever it might be that's next to the person that you want to grapple after. So let's say you're chasing somebody and they're about to get out of range of your grapple. If you shoot with the auto-aim grapple, 
it will try and grapple the target, the person. But if you grapple the floor next to where they are, um, it's going to have the, pretty much the same effect. But if you auto-aim and if you're trying to grapple the specific person, if they manage to get out of range of your grapple, your grapple will go through, but then cancel. And you'll, you won't like maintain momentum. And you might end up not catching that person. So a very useful thing to have on. Definitely will recommend this. Uh, oh, and side note, never, ever, ever, I cannot stress this enough, never, ever, ever turn off melee aim assist. No matter what anyone ever tells you, this is one of the most important things to have on in the game. And anyone who tells you otherwise is talking out of their ass. I swear to God. Like, as of right now, there is no reason why you should ever have this off. This is possibly one of the most important settings to have on. Because it allows you to... I mean, it does what it says, you know, like, it's going to magnet your attacks to your opponent. And it's something that everybody uses. It's not about whether or not you're skilled or not. It is simply something that is part of the game and that you should 100% use no matter what. And that takes us over to number five. Another setting or keybind that some of you may have noticed is quick parry and normal parry. As a new player, I do recommend that you start playing the game using quick parry. As quite frankly, it's just a more optimal choice. This is due to the fact that it allows you to parry out of most animations without having to cancel it manually first. This didn't used to be a thing way back in the day, so if you see videos claiming that quick parry is bad, make sure that it's up to date before you listen to it. If you head on over here, quick counter. This is what I'd recommend using as a new player. All right, for, for sure. Um, there is an option. Where is it? There is an option here. So if you were to turn this off, it'll, it would essentially make it so that the only way that you can parry is by using quick counter. And the normal way of parrying, which is pressing both mouse buttons at the same time, would no longer act as a parry. It wouldn't work. Um, you can do this, but I do not recommend it. Even though quick parry is by far the more optimal choice, there are a couple things that you can only do with normal parry, um, or could do better with normal parry. So, first of all, is a sprinting parry. So, this is the act of parrying straight out of sprint, basically. Um, without any action beforehand. So this is what it looks like with a normal parry. As you can see. And this is what it looks like with quick parry. It's ever so slightly slower. This is quick parry. And the reason why this happens is because Quick Parry is trying to essentially take you out of the sprinting animation before parrying. Even though sprinting or parrying straight out of sprint is clearly doable, it still tries to stop you and then use the parry. Well, um, and it's possible that they might fix this at some point, but for now this is this is one of those things. Uh, and the next thing is the next thing is the ability to cancel sliding a normal crouched or jumping attacks more easily into parry. So when doing it with quick parry, it occasionally doesn't cancel the animation that you're trying to cancel, but instead buffers the input for after the animation or whatever it was that you were trying to cancel. So let's say for example you're doing a sliding uh, a sliding uppercut with longsword, right? You're trying to do a sliding uppercut. If you watch closely here, slide. You can see that the animation is starting up. Right? This is the this is the full animation. If you can see this is by this is by pressing um this is being in sprint, crouching, pressing the vertical attack button and then before the animation is completed 
pressing the, uh, the horizontal one at the same time. You're essentially cancelling it into that. And it works with everything, really. You can do it with the katana. You can do it with every weapon. And it works It works with um, jumping attacks. It works with normal crouched attacks. But uh, it's most easily like visible. It's most easy to demonstrate by doing the sliding up. Right. Um, and possibly the most useful. Because it's got a longer startup animation. Meaning that you're going to be able to cancel it when you want to. But if you try and do this with... Quick, uh, quick counter. Sometimes it does this, as you can see. So this is when you try and do what I just did with quick counter instead. And sometimes it works, just like I did then. But the thing is, some of the time it's also just going to not do anything. Or give you an, a pre-input parry after your animation has finished. Which isn't necessarily what you want. Oh, yes. Moving on over to number six, understanding soul jades. Now, Naraka, as you may know, has a lot of different melee and ranged weapons. And for each of those weapons, there are soul jades, each, all of which have something special about them, change something about how each weapon functions in one way or another. As well as this, there are, of course, your base white and blue soul jades that only give you passive stats and nothing more. So each purple soul jade gives you these passive stats as well. Along with the weapon changing passive. Let's pull these up over here. So let's say purple soul jades, overlord. If I pick that up. 6%, plus 6% melee, uh, melee damage reduction. Um, but gold soul jades... So the, the purple one will give you the same stats as the blue one would do, but the gold one, the gold melee resist jade, for example, will give you extra. It will give you plus 9% instead of plus 6. Oh, sorry. Now one thing to note is that it doesn't matter how many jades with the same stat that you take, once you reach the cap of each stat, you can't, you, uh, you can't get any more. That's it. Media resist caps out at 24%. So if you like, you can take four melee resist jades. And that's, gener that's generally a, a good way of looking at it. Four of the same jade is typically going to cap your stats for that jade. So with attack, plus 16%. However, although when it comes to attack, Juggernaut, Desperation, and consumables such as Prickly Pears... They act as a as a different source of bonus attack. So as you can see here, Juggernaut attack plus one. This stacks up. So every time you get a kill, it gives you um, 3%. And it gives you an extra 16% total. So you can essentially get up to plus 32% attack with ju a fully stacked Juggernaut and max attack. And then if you were to run Desperation, Desperation is a Soul Jade where... When you're below 50% HP, it gives you an attack bonus. Um, it would uh, it would count as extra attack. Uh, but other than that, there isn't there are no exceptions. Um, health. 48% health plus 48%, and then range resists. There we are. Plus 40% range damage reduction, and then plus 32% head defense. Now, I would love to go into more detail about which soul jades are good, which soul jades aren't so good, but I'm going to leave that for another video, so be on the lookout for that. Now, moving us on to number 7. Some of you may be wondering where exactly I am just chilling you know doing stuff <laughs> um but uh some of you obviously do know it's pretty easy to find and this is the training grounds and it does pretty much what it says it is a place where you can go to test and practice all kinds of things you can customize the bots in the training ground to do different things such as release blue focus attacks 
at you with different weapons, you know? Or get them to simply run around like headless chickens so you can practice your aim. Um, to do this, you'll have to press F4 on your keyboard and it will bring up a small menu in the top left. Now, they do tend to change the trading range from time to time, so bear in mind this might not look like how it does for you right now, depending on when you're watching this video. Um, but here, if you go up to the top, sparring partner, you could change the sparring partner to anything you like. Let's see, eight and see chickens. <laughs> and they will literally just run around. Right. Um, but yeah, once you selected the option that you'd like, you have to turn combat mode on. One really cool feature about this game mode is that when you move it on over to combos training, and then you turn it on, you might be wondering why it's not moving. The reason why that is, is because it is waiting for you to hit it. And then once you hit it, it will then try to dodge away the moment that it can. Meaning that essentially you can test combos on this, uh, on this bot and make sure that they're true combos. Now, a true combo, just a brief explanation, is a combo that is inescapable without some kind of ability that you can use whilst under attack. Right? This is a very useful tool uh, for the training grounds, and I highly recommend that you use it. Training grounds, very useful. And now on to number eight, movement mechanics. Movement mechanics being, some people, for some people, the best part of the game. The movement in Naraka is by far one of the most important tools that you have at your disposal. Mastering it will give you a substantial edge over your opponents, being able to jump in and out of fights swiftly, whilst potentially leaving the opportunity for re-engage open at all times, making you extremely hard to deal with. The first thing that I would like to talk to you about is scale rushing. This is one of the best tools that you can use to move around terrain, such as buildings and cliffs more easily. All, of it, all it is, is attaching yourself to a wall or ceiling and simply pressing your horizontal attack button. Once you do that, it will then send you, it will launch you from the wall in the direction of where your camera is facing by tapping it. Or you can choose to hold it and charge it up to a blue focus stage which will do more damage and will go further, empowering the tank, which can do devastating damage with the rare weapons, or can simply be a tool to open up your opponent and put them into a combo. An important thing to note is that although you can do this on walls and ceilings, when it comes to cylindrical objects, such as trees or pillars, if you attach yourself to a tree or a pillar and just tap your horizontal attack button, it will take you up the tree, doing a sort of upward sweep. Now this, although like it's not your instant scale rush, which you typically are going to want, going up the tree, it allows you to scale the tree very easily and very quickly. If you use this, press the horizontal type button and then immediately jump cancel the end of the animation and then repeat. So, as you can see here, right. very handy, very useful, and using this you'll be able to maneuver around the map very easily, move around uh, trees very easily. Now, if you do want to scale rush from a tree, you're going to have to attach yourself to the tree, press and then hold all the way to the blue focus stage before it's going to give you the scale rush. Although, it is kind of annoying. <laughs> Back in the very beginning, the very beginning in the old days, we used to be able to scale rush instantly off of trees, but they removed it because it caused a few issues with certain characters being just too difficult to catch. Now, another extremely important mechanic that you're going to want to learn as soon as you can is blue focus hold dodging, or sometimes known as focus sliding. Focus slide is also the name of the soul jade, but it isn't needed in this 
or neither is it related to what I'm going to tell you. This mechanic is the act of, whilst in the running state, to hold one of your attack buttons, and start charging blue focus, and then allowing the animation to carry you forwards, essentially sliding with the momentum, and then pressing and holding your dodge button once you reach the furthest distance, and then going back to sprinting. This mechanic allows you to move much faster than just normal sprinting, as well as being a key tool when fighting, since it allows you to move around and manage the spacing between you and your opponent more easily. For, wep for most weapons, you'll want to use the vertical attack button, but there are exceptions, such as Pulse Sword. With Pulse Sword, you're going to want to use the horizontal attack button. All it is, whilst in running state, as you can see, when you are doing this animation, when you press your vertical attack button and start holding it, it continues to carry you forward, just like so. Right? You don't want to release the attack, you want to cancel it once it reaches the furthest point. Not only this, but each weapon tends to also have its own specific movement tech. For example, longsword. If you do what I said, holding horizontal whilst sprinting, but instead of cancelling the animation at the end, to simply allow the light attack to go through, as you can see, if you were to hold the button and then let go of it, it sends you flying forwards. So instead of cancelling the animation, and then dodging out. You want to let go of the light attack, so to speak, and then dodge, and then repeat. This is ever so slightly faster. It does make a little bit of noise, bear that in mind, um, but it is ever so slightly faster. Um, it's definitely very useful. Another quick one would be slide, jump, right? Slide, jump, crouch, jump, and then horizontal on greatsword or pulse sword. Right? Very straightforward, very easy. And this is actually a really good one because it means that you can manage your stamina far more easily. It's not going to run out of stamina as quickly. very useful here. Uh, one thing to note is that when you're running around the map and you're doing this, you're trying to move around as fast as you can, bear in mind that this does consume your stamina very quickly. If you're spamming it non-stop, it's going to consume your stamina. Meaning that if you're running around and someone's seen you do all of these, they're going to know that you don't have any stamina left. So one thing that you can do is to mix this, mix this in with your normal just walking around movement, right? And then once you get to about half of your stamina bar, just swap to swap to slide jump, you know? Slide jumping is also an effective movement tech. And it's ever so slightly faster, depending on how fast you do it. Obviously, slide, jump, slide, jump. So, a couple of these couple of these, a couple more of these, you know, <laughs> mix it up. All right, it's essentially just so you don't run out of stamina and you just don't get absolutely lobbied because you can't move when you run into somebody. Um, there are obviously many more bits of movement tech that I would love to go into, but again, I'm going to leave that for another time. Or if you really want to ask, you can always come by my stream. I stream almost every day with the occasional day off to either coach or make videos, or just rest up. Moving on to number number nine. Half-charging, escaping stagger, and understanding focus. Now this is probably one of the most important out of the ten things that I'm going to talk to you about. In Naraka, there is light, blue, purple, gold, and ultimate focus. But first, it's probably worth sticking to the main ones, which are light and blue. When you are light attacking somebody, 
they get staggered, right? Simple. However, if that person is holding one of their attack buttons, and it is, it's in blue focus state, like this, that means they do, no, do not get staggered by light attacks any longer. If you're holding this blue focus state, then you can no longer be staggered by light attacks. The only thing that will stagger them is another blue focus. So, blue focus takes priority over light attacks, right? But not just the attack itself, but the act of being in the focus state before the weapon has uh, released the attack, right? So, now some people talk about there being a rock-paper-scissors mechanic in Naraka. And I don't really like this term, as it doesn't really encompass everything. And if you're going to dumb it down, it's much, it's less of rock, paper, scissors and more 50-50 in that you either commit or you don't. The idea that you can either look to contest what an enemy player is doing or to back off in some way, you can do this while still ma maintaining pressure or not. Regardless, you're submitting yourself to a, you're not, you aren't submitting yourself to a gambit. Sorry, getting a bit off track here, but definitely worth thinking about. The main thing I'm trying to demonstrate is that you should be very conscious of how you look to open an engagement or look to try and prevent yourself from getting locked down. And that you should be aware of the fact that when you hold blue focus, it doesn't mean that you have to release it as a blue focus attack and risk getting parried to get any value. You can simply release it before it gets to the first charged state. This means that you can essentially tank light attacks and avoid the stagger or all the attacks and then choose to either continue holding and look to potentially release the blue focus or you can release it as a light attack and if correctly timed potentially catch your po opponent in between animations gaining you an opening for a combo now this obviously isn't something that you always want to do no matter what the there is certainly value in simply releasing the blue focus attack having held it in your opponent's face or trying to bait them into parry you know and then following up with a light attack combo i could probably talk about this all day there are so many intricate lines and different strategies with so many so so many different situations that you can find yourself in so but again i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go too far into it the main things to take away I would say are being conscious of the fact that holding blue while will allow you to avoid light attack stagger and it doesn't need to be released as a blue focus every time it seems like a rather basic concept but it's something that i hear a lot of new players not being able to realize right away including me back in the day when the game very first went live on its day one um but yeah instead of going into exactly what all other focus states are I think it's best to simply leave it as a sort of hierarchy and it will allow you to determine what beats what, so to speak. So at the very bottom, you have light attacks, then blue focus, then purple focus. This is essentially blue focus that cannot, cannot be parried. However, if it collides with another blue focus attack, it will clank it's when the two focus attacks hit each other and then bounce off. Above that is gold focus, and this is a focus state that cannot be parried, nor can it be clanked by anything below it, so it can't be clanked by purple, blue, or light attacks. It can only clank against other gold focuses. And then above that, you have ultimate focus. Now this is basically the term given to gold focus that you get when you're using an ability, an, an ultimate or an ability. Typically you have the you have this focus state on the activation of your ultimate and there are so many different interactions between different ability focuses and weapon focuses and that would take way too long to go through so as a general rule of thumb this hierarchy hierarchy focuses will, will always be true light attack blue focus purple focus gold focus ultimate focus and finally, that takes us on to our very final thing that I wish I knew when I very first started. Last, but definitely not least, ask questions. <laughs> now, this seems trivial, 
But in reality, the more questions you ask, the more you will learn. Since this game is relatively unique and doesn't have other games that you can draw direct comparisons with, it means that coming into it isn't always going to be easy. There are plenty of concepts that are yet to be established. If you think of an FPS game, for example, most people who play these games are going to understand the idea of trading. The theory that you and your teammate will look to potentially peak an opponent, and if the, if the first person who peaks dies, it is then the job of the second person to peak to trade that kill for the person who killed his teammate. But when it comes to Naraka, concepts like this aren't unnecessarily established yet, and they aren't necessarily easily understood at first. Now, on top of all this, the fact that on top of the fact that asking for help is always going to be useful, the fact that the Noraka community, I have to say, has been the friendliest and the most welcoming community I have ever been a part of. And people are always going to be very willing and happy to help for those who ask for it. This is where your story begins. I'm sorry I won't.